This is the J. Scott Outdoors podcast on Western big game hunting and fishing brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and join today. I'm your host, J. Scott, and I live and breathe hunting and fishing, spending half the year in the field experiencing God's creation. I hope you'll enjoy hearing about our adventures. Welcome to the podcast. We have a awesome opportunity today to listen to a great friend of mine, Steve Chappell, who is a fantastic elk caller. Uh, There was so much good content in this interview that I actually broke it up into two uh, episodes uh, so that one would not be too long in length. So we've got two perfect size episodes here on learning how to elk call with Steve Chappell. Uh, We go over some real details on diaphragm calling, obviously using the mouth calls, um, and then we go into using the external read calls, and Steve is fantastic at using external read calls, so I know you guys are going to really enjoy this episode. I want to thank all you guys, uh, my listeners out there. Uh, I've been getting great reviews on iTunes. We've been getting five-star ratings. I constantly getting emails uh, with people that you want to hear on the podcast. Uh, If you have someone or or, uh, something that you'd like me to talk about on the podcast, please send me an email at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. I've got a lot of great guests scheduled and we're going to cover a lot of topics uh, here in Arizona. The draw results for elk and antelope have just recently came out. The credit cards have been hit, and everybody's jockeying for positions to figure out whether they're going to go with the guide and outfitter, or if they're going to do the hunts on their own, and that's just a real exciting time. Uh, We had uh, a mild winter, uh, but a few timely storms this spring, and it's yet to be determined what the antlers are going to do, but we hope for maybe another storm or two between the dry season, which is May and and, uh, June. And then obviously we can hope for an early monsoon as quickly as possible. Uh, I'd like for you to uh, be aware of um, how you can follow along and jscottoutdoors.com is a good place to start. We also have a YouTube channel, jscottoutdoors YouTube. Um, We've got, I wanna say 1300 subscribers Um, we've got over a million three, I think views, and, um, we're always posting good content up there. You can follow along at Instagram or on Instagram at J Scott outdoors. You can follow my associate Dar Colburn at D A R R Colburn C O L B U R N. Uh, he has a nice Instagram channel as well. You can follow along at J. Scott Outdoors Facebook page and and give the page a like if you if you enjoy seeing uh, what what we've got going on there. And I just want to thank you for all the support and uh, really appreciate the uh, five star ratings and comments on iTunes. That helps our placement there. So if you haven't, please go on there and uh, give us give us a good report, and um, we'll continue to bring you as much top-notch information as we can and uh, just an exciting time of year a bunch of the Arizona turkey hunts here, starting here real quickly uh, guys have been picking up sheds now for the last couple weeks and uh, spring middle beginning to middle of April is always a great time here in Arizona as across the west as people are anticipating uh, the upcoming fall season so um, let's get right into the show with Steve Chapel. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have a very special show. We actually have a great friend of mine, Steve Chapel of Chapel Guide Service. And uh, I've known Steve a long time. I think it probably goes back to the late 90s. And uh, I first met Steve on an elk hunt. His dad had an elk hunt in Arizona. And uh, Steve has become one of the best uh, elk uh, outfitting and guide services in Arizona and uh, we've been friends a long time. He's a fantastic elk caller. Uh, he's a fantastic hunter, and uh, he's a great family man, has a, has a 
lovely wife, Barb, and uh, two, two beautiful girls. And I've known Steve a long time, and he's just, I consider him a great friend. And uh, the listeners are really in for a treat today because Steve really knows what he's talking about when it comes to elk hunting. And uh, I'm going to be able to bend his he- ear a little bit today and uh, see if I can draw some of that knowledge and some of that experience out of him. And uh, we're going to talk about elk hunting, and we're going to talk about a lot of topics. So, Steve, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, Jay. I'm excited to be with you today. Yeah, this will be fun. Um, Steve, how did you get your start in hunting? You know, I grew up in uh, very rural Colorado, out in the country, lived out on a dirt road. And, uh, man, from the time I was five or six years old, my dad and my granddad were hunters, and so... I was always tagging along with them. I can remember it was probably five or six years old when I tagged along with my dad on his first mule deer hunt. And I I mean, it was just addicting from the very beginning, you know, getting up early in the morning, just the, just the smells of the trees and, you know, just the sights and, and, and the, and the, and the sun coming up in the morning, just everything about it. I just was immediately hooked. Uh, And you know how that, how that is when you're a little kid like that and you're, you feel really fortunate and blessed that your dad includes you because you're tagging along, probably making 90% of the noise and the movement, you know, doing your best to mess up the hunt, but your dad still comes through and, and gets a, gets a great deer. And, uh, you know, then just walking up to a big buck with your dad and, uh, you know, how the, the touching the antlers and just how the animal smells. It's just, you know, it was just all amazing from the very beginning. Yeah. And I mean, uh, I know your dad well, and he's a fantastic hunter. He's a houndsman, and he's just a real savvy guy. And, you know, he's just a real true woodsman. And I'm sure growing up as a kid, getting to learn from him was a real treat. I mean, because he's one of these guys that does it right and, uh, you know, very knowledgeable, quiet, you know, quiet and yes. humble, but, but really, really knows what he's doing. You know, type of guy when he speaks, people listen, and uh, I'm sure that was a real treat, uh, g- getting to really watch how, how it's done. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would say my dad was definitely my best teacher in life and, and in hunting. Um, you know, you and I actually met for the first time there on my dad's hunt, which was, by the way, in 1995, so you can believe that's been 20 years ago. Uh, That's unbelievable. That makes you and I fairly old. Yeah, (laughs) You know, you and I really have kind of grown up together in elk hunting because I feel like I was still really a pretty green elk hunter and elk caller at that time. And I'll be honest, that's where I really, really got the bug, Jay, for elk. That's when elk just became my absolute favorite animal. And I've almost gotten to where it's, it's, it's really ridiculous that elk is about all that matters to me anymore. Um, It it was kind of that one trip where I decided that I've got to be a part of this every single year. Uh, You know, even if it's not me personally hunting, that I would rather be sharing the woods with people that have a great tag, you know, like we have in Arizona with the great elk we have there, Um, you know, versus me chasing small elk in in an over-the-counter state like maybe Colorado or somewhere like that. Um, I, yeah, I just decided that year that I had to be a part of that, that type of elk hunting every year. That's amazing that it was 1995. I specifically remember uh, you and your dad and, and meeting you, and I, be, I want to say that you even had a hat on that said elk alcoholic um or some maybe a shirt or something and I thought man this guy I got I got I to meet this guy and uh if I remember correctly and you the details are a little fuzzy but it seemed like you were using maybe a Carlton or maybe a double read and I had just gotten some uh new Primos uh pallet plates I believe and I think I've got to be honest, I think I even remember like getting one like that I had already used because I didn't have any new ones. And you're like, what is that call? Yep. And and you popped it in your mouth and were immediately, you know, ripping yes. and making some great sounds. Uh, <laughs> uh, remember that? that, yeah, was, that oh, was, totally. I don't I don't know that I was making good sounds right off the bat. You're way too kind there. But I, I did. I actually had a Loman 
diaphragm call. Lohman, which okay, I even, okay. I don't even know if they're around anymore. Maybe they are. Um, but yes, you're exactly right. You you gave me a black Primo Sentry pallet plate call. And, and absolutely, the first time I popped it in my mouth, I could tell right away a difference in that call versus just the standard diaphragms that did not have that pallet plate incorporated into the call. And uh, yeah, so I mean, you're, you're the one that introduced me to that pallet plate. Well, I, I, I certainly didn't bring the story up to, to make it sound like I introduced you to calling because you were, you were already <laughs> very well established uh, when I met you. But uh, what do you think it is, Steve, about that style of call compared to the older style of call or maybe the traditional style that's just the horseshoe without any sort of plate or anything? What do you think it is? that has really caught on and and for you it was a game changer right off the bat why why is that do you think um i think there's a couple of reasons um first off that really just helps with positioning the call at the right angle in the top of your mouth there's no guesswork with getting it right um and i think because it, it you got have a solid anchor there and a solid starting point um, you just get more consistent tones right off the bat. Another thing with those pallet plate calls that I've noticed is that the frame width is narrower. Now, the tape width can be the same, but the frame width is narrower, which in, in my opinion and experience makes a call easier to blow and requires less air pressure overall. And that way you can not only blow loud sounds, but I, I think more sensitive, subtle sounds are as important, if not more important, and I think that's where those pallet plate calls just really shine. Yeah, absolutely. And then Steve, th through it all, and 20 years later, you now, uh, for years, have had your own signature series calls with the uh, with the diaphragms and with the different external calls. Um, can you go in a little bit on how that? Uh, transition took place and how, how all of that came came to be oh absolutely yeah like we talked about I just immediately saw in the beginning that that pallet plate was was definitely a cut above I think it's probably one of the most if not the most um, extraordinary ideas that's come to elk calling you know in the last 40 years or however long elk calls have been along uh, because it's lasted. It's not been a flash in the pan type of thing. Um, Rocky Jacobson, by the way, was the guy who originally invented the pallet plate. Um, you know, and we, we know, of course, the Primos, um, you know, got a lo lot of notoriety from those calls. Uh, Rocky still manufactures those. Um, I was able to meet Rocky, actually, through a good friend of ours, Corey, who happens to be Rocky's son, and he introduced me to his dad, and, and Rocky and I got to talking about elk calls and elk calling, and I had some ideas. I actually had a prototype for, a, for an open read call that I showed to him, and, and that's kind of how it all got started. Um, I, I think you and I both are pretty um, opinionated as far as tone quality and just how we want a call to sound. I, I, I think that's right in knowing you for about 20 years that, that yeah. we both have pretty strong ideas on how, what we think a call should sound like. And, and so, I, you know, I brought some of those ideas to Rocky and, uh, you know, he, he took those back to the factory and uh, went to work on it. And, you know, we he, he mailed calls back and forth to me, di different prototypes back and forth. And um, I just really feel like, you know, really nailed it right on the head as far as we've got three mouth diaphragms um, that, that are my signature series mouth diaphragms. Uh, there's one that's called the Estrus Excited Reed. It's an orange colored reed. Then we have another one that's called the Closer. It's a it's a red tape diaphragm that's kind of a hybrid uh, double reed call. It's not a full double reed. It's got one single reed and then a then a cut reed on the second reed. And then we also have a blue reed that's called the Challenge Call. It's a little more sensitive and a little higher pitched than the other two calls. So they each kind of have their purpose and specialty. And I think you know, everybody's going to kind of have their preference just based on how they blow a call and, and how they want to call the sound. Um, but, but for me, they work really well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the first call that I showed to Rocky was a prototype that we actually ended up with the Matriarch, uh, which is an open read call. 
Um, it's got a mylar reed, you know, similar to like the Primo's Hyperlip Single or the or the Carlton Estrus wine. It's similar to that. The difference is is that it has a wood barrel. And for I would say about a decade, I was always intrigued with how a call, how an open reed mylar call would sound with a wood barrel. And uh, when we developed this call, I'm just extremely pleased with the tonal quality that you get out. I think you get just a richness and sweetness that you just can't quite get out of plastic with that call. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I, to this day, tell everybody that I know that the, the best external reed elk caller I've ever heard in my life is you. And I stand by that. I, I, I believe there's not anybody on the planet that can blow an external call as good as you can. Uh, and, and quite honestly, with the advancements you've made with your diaphragm calling, I mean, it, it, it's mind boggling. Um, but originally, uh, you know, you, you and I used to, you know, go chase elk and guide elk and, you know, hunt elk together and stuff. And, and I'm always, uh, can always remember in the back of my mind just how sweet you can make those external read calls sound. So the Matriarch call was built to your specific specifications with the soundboard and the Mylar uh, width and, and length and the whole and all the way down to the wood barrel, correct? Yes, yes, exactly. Rocky and I kind of um, exchanged back and forth. Um, with him sending me various prototypes and it took a few times to be honest uh, kind of made me feel a little bit bad but uh, I knew what I wanted and I tell you what when it when it came back uh, how it is ultimately now right away from the first blow like I said I'm, I'm pretty opinionated on how I want an elk call to sound and it was just absolute right on the money so yeah very very pleased with that um uh, I think a, a, a mylar open reeded call is is just like a, a mouth read in that a guy's got to spend the time to really get comfortable and confident in it because I'm sure you would agree, Jay, that when you go to the woods, that's the real proving grounds. And if you blow it just a little bit in the off season, then you get out there in the woods and there's a bull out there bugling in front of you. It's a real humbling experience and it can... Uh, those those nerves can really take over, and if you you haven't spent the time on the call to practice, um, your nerves can definitely get in the way. Absolutely, and and Steve, talk a little bit about open read calling, and you know what I witness with with guys out in the woods when I hear guys not making quality sounds. One of the most the biggest things that I hear is a they're too loud, and b they're real harsh, and somewhere along the lines that you know we've been taught to, wow, 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 you know, and right. you know, just be obnoxious. Talk to me a little bit about if you agree with that, as far as th that that perception, and in your mind when you're actually calling with your external call, what are you thinking? What you know? What are what are you trying to? portray with that call and what tone, what sound, what are you thinking with that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with everything you just said right there. Um, I believe that on an open read call that being subtle and sweet is the key and having that nice, subtle, sweet, elky tone is, is what you want. Um, I, I kind of equate it to this. If I go into a restaurant and there's somebody talking very loudly and kind of dominating the environment, it kind of sets me off a little bit. It, it's, it's, it's just a little distracting. And I, for me, it's kind of the same way in the elk woods. Maybe, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. But um, when I go out there, I, I, I have the mindset of wanting to sweet talk to that bull and, and just, you know, whisper in his ear and give him that opportunity for romance, you know. Um, do, do you think that, and sorry if I interrupted you, do you think that people, it's just been taught incorrectly or do you think the reason that people get real loud and real abrasive on the call is because it takes a little bit of finesse and you have to work with your call a little bit to get that a little bit more controlled and sweet sound it, it it's almost to me like that's just a way since they're not very good with their call that it's just easy for them to blow it loud and blow it abrasive yeah exactly it's easier that way 
um, if you don't spend a lot of time and learn real real breath control. And, and to be honest with you, it starts with emotion control. Like I was saying earlier, um, it's, it's amazing how it can get to you when you get out there in the woods and there's a bull bugling in front of you and you get that kind of shortness of breath and get that ch more choppy breath instead of the, the deep breaths that you need to take to, to make yourself relax. Um, I, kind of, I kind of go back to this. When I was young and I played baseball and I would get up there to hit, uh, of course, you, you know, anybody that's played baseball would agree with me. It's, it's a very nerve wracking thing. But what I would do is in my mind, I would place myself in my yard with my dad pitching to me. And I would literally say to myself, throw one, groove one right down the middle, dad, and I'm going to rip it right back at, at you. You know what I mean? I'm going to knock your head yeah. off with the ball. I'm going to hit a line drive right back at you. And yeah. it sounds kind of unrelated to elk calling. But what I try to do is, is when I have a, a bull in front of me is put myself in that, that kind of comfortable spot. In, in other words, maybe, uh, you know, blowing the call in, in the study in my house. I kind of put, take my mind there or maybe in my truck where I'm just relaxed and blowing and just imagine myself being there. And it kind of takes me away from the intensity of the moment, if you know what I'm saying. I still obviously want to enjoy the moment because there's nothing like September out there in the woods but I think if you let your mind just go too crazy, because I think it's calling is so mental, um, you know, besides knowing the sound that you want to make it, it, a lot of it is, is just mental and emotion control, um, you know, to get those, those sweeter, more subtle sounds that you, know, that, you know, that we're talking about that are the key to calling these bulls in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree with everything you're saying there. Um, do you have, uh, an external nearby that you could give me a little uh, sequence of kind of how you just, uh, you know, blow that call and maybe talk a little bit about are you blowing just straight out of your, you know, with your with your mouth or are you, you know, sucking the air out of your diaphragm? Could you give me a little demonstration? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've got a matriarch here. And okay. the, the first thing, like like you said there, you want to think about getting the air from deep in your stomach, in other words, from a deep breath, just as if you were singing or blowing a musical instrument. That's what I would equate it to. So you're not wanting to just huff, huff the, the sound through your mouth, um, because what that tends to do is, is give you those more harsh, loud, brash sounds, and it also tends to um, direct more saliva into the call, which is ultimately going to make it stick pretty quickly. Um, also, another thing is, is your lips. They're the real key. Um, I've always felt that the key to blowing these calls is to use your lips rather than your teeth on the call. So what I'm actually doing is I'm wrapping my lips around my teeth to start with, to kind of, to kind of pad the mylar reed with my lips rather, rather than having my teeth directly on it. And then I'm just thinking about getting a nice, controlled, deep breath, and then just, you know, just directing nice, soft, consistent air pressure over the reed as I blow it with my lips on it. And I'm not, I'm not sliding the call in and out at all uh, to get the varying tones. I'm just varying my lip pressure. So a, a firmer lip pressure is going to give me a higher pitch. And softer lip pressure is going to give me a deeper pitch. It's going to sound something like this. Okay, some, just something like that. Um, and, and Steve, can I add something there? I've seen you do it so many times. When you put the external call up to your lips, I've watched you do it enough, and I actually incorporated it into my own calling. You actually kind of slowly and real precisely kind of set it in there and gently. You don't like just jam it in your mouth. You like bring your lips, talk a little bit about your lip placement and, and about your lip pressure that you were talking about before. I mean, it's a real precise thing. I will, I've seen you do it a million times. Talk about yeah, that. Yeah, maybe I over-exaggerated a little bit, but you're right. I'm very methodical about it. I think maybe that's just my personality, but I, I kind of equate it to shooting a bow. I like to have, um, you know, I almost call them anchor points. Um, in other words, I'm thinking about Definitely wrapping my lips around my teeth at the proper pressure. Um, you know, a guy that's new to this is just going to have to experiment a little bit with what that right lip pressure is. 
And then secondarily, um, I think about sliding the call. This call has a castration ring on it. And I've got the ring, oh, I'd say about 80% in on the call toward the barrel. I'm going to get my lips right up close to that castration band to where I can actually feel them just above my lip line there. I can feel that castration ring. And then I'm also going to touch the, the middle knuckle of my index finger on the end of my nose, kind of as my anchor point. And that just makes it consistent for me. Because I think that's the key with getting consistency when you're out there, when all everything's going on and the nerves are running high. Uh, you know, the more repeatable you can make it, the, the more consistent you're going to be. And you also, and and uh, the listeners can go on Steve's YouTube channel, uh, can get any one of Steve's DVDs and watch him doing this. But you also hold the call precisely and allow your three fingers, your middle finger, your ring finger, and your pinky finger almost to kind of stand up like you're making the OK symbol, right? Like <laughs> like you're touching your thumb and your forefinger together, and you kind of open your, your hand. Exactly. Um, because I think a mistake that can be made is you can tend to, uh, you know, not want to make a bad sound, and so you'll tend to choke the call down. And that's not going to sound as natural. So, yes, I will circle the call with my, my index finger and my thumb because I think it kind of lends itself to, to producing a nice nasal quality when you do that. But then you are correct. I do leave my other fingers uh, pretty much open. Occasionally I'll, I'll bring, bring my end finger down to deflect the sound a little bit. But, uh, yeah, I mostly call pretty, pretty open, I would say, with my hand to get that right, that tone that I'm looking for. That's great. And Steve, so you initially just blew just a couple real soft mews. Uh, give me something where, you know, you're, the bull is definitely interested, but maybe give me a little more emotion. Give me something that, that, that you're going to, that you're going to use out in the woods and maybe, you know, really try and entice that bull to uh, come check you out. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like, just like with turkey calling, you're taking every bull's temperature, and the more he responds to it, if he sounds excited and emotional about his response, then I'll typically add just a little more emotion to my call, although I don't want to overdo it, because I'm a real believer in continuing continuing to do what he's liking. But, uh, you know, I might turn it up a little and make, make this type of sound. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, how frequently do I call? You know, typically when I'm calling to a bull, I'll, I'll, I'll call and then I'll wait for him to bugle. And then when he bugles, I'll give him an answer back. But generally, I'm blowing anywhere from maybe one to three calls back at him. You know, I'm not going to I'm not going to pound him and do five or ten calls and, and, and just sound like I'm, you know, really loud mouthed and over, over aggressive out there. Um but as long as he's liking what I'm giving him, that's what I'm going to continue to do. Just keep pouring it, pour it on him. And, uh, you know, by the way, I, I, I never mix in an odd sound. Uh, you know, like, for instance, if he's coming into a cow call, if I'm blowing an open reed like I'm doing here, I'm not going to start glunking at him. Um, I'm not going to start bugling at him. I'm just going to give him what he's responding to and what he's coming to. Absolutely. I think that's a great tip. And I think, you know, being a turkey hunter, uh, I find myself wanting to cluck, purr, yelp, do the whole thing. And it's like, you know, yes, you hear turkeys doing it sometimes, but a lot of times they're just kind of doing their thing. They're not running through the full gamut of the, you know, the calling contest out there in the woods. That's just not how they communicate. And I yes. think elk are the same way in that, Absolutely. you know, you're, you're basically just saying, I'm available over here. I'd like you to come over here. What are you doing? Come over here. Instead of saying, you know, what are you doing? What do you want for dinner? How do you know, you don't, you don't just run through <laughs> the whole, you know, question and, and he's going to think yeah. I'm not going to, that's a, that's a mess waiting to happen over there. Yeah, the class um, 30 questions, you're exactly right about that. Um, you know, you just come home from the office and you get 40 questions before you even set your briefcase down. I mean, that's just not going to cut it. Uh, Steve, at the end of your call, I think what, what's 
different from your call than 99.9% .9 of everybody else out there is you're able to have that just nice, I, I don't even know what the word is, but there's like a transition where you're into your note and then you're kind of letting it get real nasally. How, how could you explain that to people as far as getting as nasally as possible? Uh, I, I know it's hard to explain, but what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's obviously breath and air control uh, first off. And then, and then I think secondarily, it's just having a subtle shift in lip pressure, not too abrupt there at the end because you're going, uh, you know, from that firmer lip pressure to a, to a lighter, more medium lip pressure there at the end. Um, and, and there, and there's definitely, uh, if you watch yourself in the mirror or something, when you blow a call, you'll see that your jaw, your, your jaw and chin are going to drop to get that, to get that tone change. Um, but again, I think it's, I think it's just being subtle about it rather than, you know, like you say, jamming the call in your mouth, uh, you know, making a harsh tone and then, and then dropping your jaw real fast. I think that, you know, to say, you know, predator calling than elk calling where I think sure. being subtle and, and sweet is, is more important. Sure. And, and, a lot of the DVDs and the instructional stuff out there have talked about really sliding the call as far as making a big move from the front of the call towards the castration band. And I learned from you on the external. And I mean, you're, it's all about lip pressure with you. It's not about That's moving an in, half an inch on the call. Uh, in reality, you're not, your lips are not moving back or forward in any direction. It's staying the same, but your lip pressure is looser and tighter, and, and you are not a proponent of sliding that call in and out. Yeah, not at all. I, th I think it makes it more repeatable if you're just varying lip pressure. And a, 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 something else that needs to be brought up is when we're out there elk hunting, we're not in the ideal environment. By that, I mean we're not sitting in our office or in our truck where it's 70, 75 degrees and our body's warm, our lips and mouth are warm. No, it's it's more like we're out there. It's It can be, you know, anywhere from the low to high 30s on a typical, typical September morning. Um, you know, you've walked a mile, mile and a half to even get in position to blow your first call at these elk. And by that time, you're a little short of breath. Your lips are dry. Um, you, you know, you, you, it's just a lot different than being in a stationary 70-degree environment. So uh, with that said, I think the more repeatable you can make it by varying your lip pressure versus sliding the call in and out, you know, where you may have dry, gummed-up lips by the time you've walked a mile and a half or more chasing a herd, I, I, I definitely think it makes you more consistent and, and, and more sweet when you're just varying your lip pressure on the call. Yeah, absolutely. And then, Steve, uh, you, you created the Matriarch call, and then you, you have a new call, uh, external call, uh, I believe, don't you? Yes, um, it's called the trophy wife. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I don't want to come across as, as gimmicky because I'm a big proponent in saying that a call that sounds elky will call elk in now. It will call elk in 20 years from now. I'm a firm believer in that. Um, but, but, you know, obviously for marketing, a, a catchy name is important, but I, I want to tell guys out there that, um, you don't necessarily need to, when you're shopping for an elk call, be so mindful of what is the newest call on the market or what call has the coolest name. Uh, it's more so what does it sound like to you? Does it, does it sound elky to you? And when you take it out there and use it in the elk woods, uh, does it call elk in? And, and if it does, again, it's going to be a call that's going to, going to do that for decades for you. Um, it, but, but back to that, I, you know, I was tossing around about 20 different names and then just all of a sudden trophy wife came to my mind and I just thought, you know, every, every big old bull out there needs, needs a trophy wife. So that, that I, name, love that name I love the name I stuck that. right away. Um, but what I love the name and the call, by the way, uh, I was able to pick one up and, uh, I love it. It's, uh, it's got a really good sound. Do you happen to have one of those that you could demonstrate for us? Yeah, and I think what separates it from other calls, and including the Matriarch, is that it's got a clear Mylar reed, which is a little more sensitive uh, than just the white standard Mylar reed. 
So right up, right there, it's got it's going to have a little different tonal quality. Um, I believe it's a little more. Uh, it's got a little more voice, a little more nasal quality to it. Um, it does have a plastic barrel, but I think in combination with that clear mylar reed, it has just the right tone. And here's what it sounds like. Yeah, and that, that, that's the trophy wife. Um, again, it's this, you're using the same technique that you would blow the matriarch with. Um, but I think definitely that call in combination with the matriarch. So, you know, some days, matter of fact, a couple of years ago when I first had the prototype of the trophy wife, I was out in the woods and uh, ha happened to be blowing the matriarch because it's worked for me for the last five years so well and continue, continually does. Um, but I did have one bull in particular that got just a little bit hesitant, and uh, I, I pulled out that trophy wife and started blowing it, and it, it fired him right up, and he, he came right in on a stream. So uh, That's awesome. Just, how, how, how often will you blow the matriarch a little bit and get, a, you know, get some bulls responding and then blow the tr trophy wife, just give them just a little bit different sound, or will you primarily just stick with one and, and just run one? I'm... I'm more so, if I had to say, a one-call kind of guy, and I think, again, it kind of goes back to my methodical personality. I'll just get in a groove with the call. I think you would agree, you know, you get calls that you just feel really comfortable and confident in, uh, whether they be open read or, or a, a nice broke-in diaphragm. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I lean more so to be, be, be more of a one-call type of guy, um, but I will – you know, based on the situation, if a, if a bull's not responding or I'm not getting responses, period, I'll try something different because, you know, definitely you don't want to keep trying what's not working. Absolutely. Um, both of those external calls are fantastic. I've used the Matriarch uh, uh, for ever since it came out, and uh, I also like the Primos Hyperlip single and, and yes. use both of them. Uh, uh, and I can't wait to try this uh, trophy wife out in the woods. It uh, it's got a real just real nice sound. It, it to me, it almost sounds a little bit like a younger cow, just like um, you know. And I don't know that it's a huge difference, but it just seems it seems kind of hot. If that may, you know, it's kind of yeah, it's kind of just got a little bit of pizzazz. I don't know if that's the right word, yeah. but you kind of know what I'm saying. It's yeah. just got a little bit of a pop to it. Right. And um, I, I really like the way it sounded. Uh, you can get these calls. My listeners uh, can get these calls right off your website, right, at uh, a Chapel uh, Guide Service? Yes, chapelguideservice.com, and just go on to the Elk Call page. There's plenty of, uh, you know, links to click on there to get to that page. Um, I do sell these calls in package deals, so there's, you know, lots of money can be saved if you order more than one call. Um, I also offer free shipping because I don't think a guy should get penalized, um, you know, for making an online order. Uh, and, and I even offer them in combination with videos or DVDs, I should say. So yeah, sure. all in all, I think my website's a great, great place to get these calls. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I appreciate all the business I get on the website and, you know, I'm always a proponent of saying you don't want to try out and learn the calls on the elk. In other words, you don't want to order the call September 1st <laughs> because, yeah. You're going to be learning and trying it out on the elk. If, if you make it a habit of, of blowing that call, you know, when I first started out, I'd say I blew an elk call probably 300 days out of the year. And, and I don't mean you had to blow it an hour, but, you know, maybe five or ten minutes a day. Uh, it just keeps it fresh. That, to me, is where you can experiment and learn new and different sounds that, you know, you, you never thought you could produce before. Um, so yeah, I say all that to say this, the, the, the earlier you, you, uh, get your calls, regardless of if they're mine or primos or whoever's calls you happen to use and, and, and practice on them, you know, yearly instead of just very seasonally, the better off you're going to be calling elk in. Yeah. I mean, uh, I've actually, my, my buddy Giannis from, uh, uh, Colorado, now Montana. Um, I turned him on years ago to the your matriarch call, and I mean, he just loves that that call, and he's very good with it. Ironically, Steve, he actually blows it upside down. Uh, <laughs> I know you know some other people that blow it upside down, but uh, yes. uh, it just makes some really nice, sweet sounds, and 
uh, your DVDs, um, you know, you can listen to your, you calling on the DVDs as well as your YouTube channel. You have a bunch of demonstrations of the call, and I just urge any of the listeners that haven't heard Steve call a lot, uh, if you want to learn how to elk call or if you want to hone your elk calling skills, uh, that is the place to go. He is the guy to listen to. He will sit here and be humble with you. But the reality is, if you want to get better, uh, get some of Steve's calls and listen and watch what he's doing. Um, he's He is as good as they get. And I, I've always told Steve if, if he would ever enter the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation calling contest, he would win hands down, and I'm a <laughs> firm believer in that. But that's not his gig, and and uh, uh, he he's uh, that I know, and Steve's the best elk caller there is out there. So um, check him out on his YouTube. That's is it is it Steve Chapel or is it um, Chapel Hunt? What is the YouTube channel? Yeah, Steve? I originally set it up as just Steve Chapel. So yeah, it's just Steve Chapel on there. Um, I'm not sure. I don't believe that I have a link off of my website, but I do have. I always have a featured video on my website on the home page where people can see that. And yes, I agree with you. That's the best place to actually learn to blow the calls uh, from a starting point is to watch those YouTube videos that are that are actually on my website on the elk call page. And then um, as far as you know, how often to blow them. Um, just how we use them when we're actually out there in the field is is to actually um, watch that on those hunting DVDs, on those Extreme Bulls DVDs. I'll, I'll tell you this, Jay. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I think I learned the ver the most about elk hunting by watching videos back in the day. You know those VHS oh, videos yeah. that that Will Primos put out and, Absolutely. and Wayne Carlton Absolutely. put out because I feel like if you watch them as a student of the game and not just an observer. If you actually say, okay, the bull just bugled, wh what is the hunter going to do in response to that? What call does, did he blow? How many times did he blow it? How loudly did he blow it? Or how softly did he blow it? Um, to be honest with you, I think you can learn more by watching a hunting video than you can a, 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 an instructional video per se, because th those in my mind, obviously just by design, are a little more canned, if you will. Um, yeah. Whereas, well, you know, exact. I mean, sorry to cut you off, but I okay. mean, I know you well enough to know that your your hunting elk DVDs, your Extreme Bulls series. I mean, you can actually hear you in the background calling, and it's not edited. It's right. what it is. So you get right. to hear the real thing. I can't honestly speak for the other companies. I think there's some editing going on, but I I, I know how you call, and I've listened to your DVDs. I've, I know how you work bulls, and it's what you hear is what you get. So, um, you know, it, it's, you're absolutely right. You can learn Steve's sequencing by just listening to his uh, Extreme Bulls series and listening to how he does it. Um, Steve, I want to transition a little bit into your diaphragms. Okay. Uh, you know, having said that, you know, you can blow an external as good as anybody I know, uh, when I – when I first met you and for a few years, you were good with a diaphragm, but there was a point in time when you, when you absolutely raised your game to a completely different level. Uh, and I know you practiced, uh, uh, Steve as a farmer by trade and, and spends a lot of time on a tractor. And I know <laughs> I would call you a lot and you would say, yeah, listen to this. And I would just be blown away on the phone. Let's dive into your signature series, uh, mouth diaphragms, mouth reads, and maybe walk me through the progression of that. Um, I r will remember back in the day, and again, you can correct me if my, you know, it seems like the older I get, the more that uh, stories are, you know, get made up in my head. <laughs> but it seems like we had just piles of, of elk calls, and one day I think you called me up and said, hey, listen to this. And I said, what the heck did you do? And you had just trimmed, you had just gotten the idea to actually trim the double reed latex and trim a diagonal, cut, diagonal or a, a diamond cut in it. And talk to me a little bit about tinkering with that kind of stuff and how it led you into your ser signature series elk calls. 
You know what, Jay, um, that was a true story, and I'd forgotten about that. You're, you're exactly right. I'd uh, gotten a prototype call from, from Will Primos, which is, was a straight uh, double read call, and it was just, for me anyway, it was just a little hard to blow. It was a pallet plate call, but even with that double read, it, it just required quite a bit of air pressure. So what I did, and I don't even know really why I did this, but I just took a little pair of surgical scissors and I just cut... Uh, you know, kind of a V in that outside read of the two, that out, uh, outside latex read, and popped it in back in my mouth, and it was amazing how much easier it was to blow, and the tonal quality was was just excellent. Um, so yeah, I, I I called you up, was real excited about it. I think it was in the late '90s, maybe, um, yeah. and ended up uh, it, that in, ultimately ended up being, I believe, the hyperplate that that yeah. Primos produces. Um, now with my my signature series calls, that is actually uh, the closer would be the the closest replication of that call that I originally worked with there. Um, I, I think that closer call that I have now is 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 excellent for bugling because it's very durable because it has the strength of being a, a double read call, so you've got that durability. But then it's also got sensitivity because uh, trimming that second reed just just uh, uh, tends to make it easier to blow and gives it just the right tonal quality. So I think it's the best of both worlds as, as far as a, a, a bugling and a cow calling reed, kind of kind of a utility call, I should say. Absolutely. And Steve, in your signature series mouth uh, calls, I believe you have three different uh, mouth calls. Uh, can you run through it? Uh, I don't know if you have them on hand, but could you maybe demonstrate the three of them and maybe talk talk about the differences? Sure. Um, the first one that I'll start with is uh, is the estrus excited read. Um, again, you know, I don't want guys to get hung up on the name of these calls. You know, obviously they have to have a, a name for the packaging and such. But the main differences in them is going to be latex latex thickness, latex stretch and whether it's a single or a double, and then also the, the frame width. So without getting too technical on it, um, this would be that estrus excited, which is the orange reed. I, I prefer it overall for, for doing my cow calling uh, because it's very sensitive, but it also produces just a nice full three-dimensional elky tone is what I really like about it. Um, this is what it would sound like just doing what I would refer to as just a just a standard nasally cow call. Stay tuned for part two, Elk Calling with Steve Chappell. Uh, we're going to be posting it here in a handful of days, and you'll get to hear the rest of the whole episode where Steve's going to cover uh, the rest of mouth calling uh, and how to cow call properly, and we cover several other topics. Uh, it's just going to be uh, another great informational educational uh, episode I want to thank you guys for listening thank you for all the support uh, we're going to keep uh, bringing you as much good information here as we can I'm excited to hear how guys are preparing for their upcoming hunts and uh, it's just an exciting time of year so make sure to check back in catch the part two of Elk Calling with Steve Chapel. And until next time, guys, God bless. Thanks for listening to the J. Scott Outdoors Western Big Game Hunting and Fishing Podcast brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and join today.